Welcome everyone, I'm Paul Hain. I'm a planetary scientist at JPL, and I'm one of the co-leads for the study, um, along with Isaac Smith, who's here in the front, from the Planetary Science Institute. He's a research scientist there. And uh, Professor Shane Byrne, who's right here, um, from the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona. Um, so first of all, we wanted to thank Michelle and, and Kiss for uh, helping to organize and, and, and selecting this study, which we think is a very important and timely study on the, uh, the climate record contained within the polar ice caps of Mars. And so in putting together the, the, the short course, we wanted to capture not only the present understanding of the polar ice caps of Mars, but also the potential that they may contain to uh, reveal a record of the past climate history of the planet, which may be one of the unique opportunities in our solar system to understand the climate history of another terrestrial planet. And so what we hope you get out of this is uh, not only an understanding of, of the, the ice caps themselves, but also the p potential that they may have for a future mission to access that record and understand uh, how the climate of Mars fits into the broader questions of climate on terrestrial planets. So that's what we hope you get out of it. Um, in putting together the, the background reading for the study, uh, we had lots of, of interesting um, topics to cover. Uh, and I just to, to have the, the papers at my fingertips, I started to, to print out all the, the papers. And I got to one notebook full of, of papers and then I got to the second notebook full of papers, and I decided to stop wasting trees at that point. <laughs> but, but the point is that there's, there's a lot to cover, and obviously we can't cover all of that this morning. Um, but the thing that I noticed about this literature uh, search was that, that a lot of this has, uh, a, a large fraction of the papers have come out in the last 10 years. And I think that speaks to the advances that have been made using uh, techniques such as orbital radar and uh, high-resolution imaging of the polar layered deposits. And so I think a lot of what you're going to see today, um, both on the observation and modeling side, reflects this significant advance in, in understanding the, the polar layered deposits of Mars um, that's happened over the past few years. So the question is, how do we leverage that understanding to take the next step and really um, get down to what climate cycles are represented by those those deposits. So um, that's just a little bit of background on the, the study. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker then, um, who is also one of our co-leads. So uh, Shane Byrne is a, an associate professor uh, of planetary science at the University of Arizona at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, he leads the Ice and Crust Exploration Process Investigation Group, which if you spell that out, that says Ice Pig. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got a really neat logo, which I think he has on his laptop, if you want to see it. Um, so uh, Professor Byrne earned his PhD in planetary science here at Caltech, where he worked with both Bruce Murray and Andy Ingersoll, who uh, is sitting right back there. And he tells me, Shane tells me that he defended his PhD on this very stage. So uh, <laughs> you'll have to forgive him if he's got a, a little bit of butterflies. Uh, um, so, okay, so before joining the, the faculty at LPL, he was also a postdoc at MIT with Maria Zuber. Um, and uh, today he's going to kick off our discussion with um, an overview of the Martian polar caps and the present conditions. Shane. Well, thanks. It's great to be here uh, this morning. And, uh, and yeah, I defended my dissertation here. Right here, actually. It was, it was, I was standing over there, so I'll try to avoid that spot of the carpet. <laughs> um, so, well, th thank you all for coming. And um, what I hope to do here today is, is spend about half an hour giving everybody kind of background material and bringing everyone up to, up to speed on what is at the Martian poles and how we think it got there and how we think it may have changed uh, over time. Um, so. Just a bit of terminology in that uh, we keep using this word cap, but I'll, I'll just say at the beginning that these caps are really the, uh, the bright, thin coverings of, say, CO2 or, or water ice that, that cover the polar layer deposits, which is where all the climatic records that we are going to talk about today are. 
Uh, so for example, the seasonal frost on Mars is CO2 ice and comes and goes uh, every Martian year. And, uh, and this has been observed for centuries. But the polar layer deposits themselves only really uh, were known about from uh, the first spacecraft flybys on. Uh, Marinus, Mariner uh, 7, I believe, actually captured the first picture of them, but it, they weren't really re recognized for what they were until uh, Mariner 9. OK, so just to um, talk a little bit about uh, why I think this is important and why we should bother doing this. Um, I think uh, there are ne several reasons for really wanting to study the polar regions of Mars. Mars is very interesting because it has Earth-like climate, although a little different, Earth-like geology, although a little different. Um, but it has uh, material that's similar enough that we can use terrestrial approaches to try and understand it. So it's kind of a unique blend of the familiar and exotic that is really uh, interesting to study. Um, but there's two main reasons that um, I think, the, well, I would say three, but there's two here. One is that um, if we can understand the polar layer deposits and the climate record they have, then that counts for a big portion of Martian history. So the Amazonian on Mars, which is three billion years or so, is really dominated by orbital fluctuations that drive polar cap changes and so on. Um, so if we can understand the last five million years, then we can understand most of the last three billion years. Um, also, um, we can understand climate variation on a simplified terrestrial planet. So there's no people, which is, uh, makes it a lot simpler. Uh, there's no vegetarian, uh, no veg uh, vegetation, no, uh, <laughs> no vegetarians either, sorry. I still wish I put my hand up for that free early meal. Um, and there's no oceans and so on. Uh, so uh, if we can't understand Mars, then you know, the pressing issue of our day, which is climate change on the Earth, is very difficult to imagine that we're ever going to understand that. Um, and another reason is that there's lots more terrestrial planets on the way uh, with uh, discovery of planets around other stars. So um, we certainly want to be able to be in a position that we understand the archetypes, which are the ones in our own solar system. OK, so as I mentioned today, we'll talk about the polar deposits as they are now, but also a little bit about what their historical story is. And I think that's uh, something that's really, um, as Paul implied, come to the fore in the last 10 years or so. And we really understand a lot more uh, than what we did. Up until that point, I think there was a lot of uh, large-scale thinking that the polar deposits represent or have this climate record in them. But it's only in the last 10 years that we really actually started to get information out of this record. And, uh, and the promise of these deposits is starting to be uh, realized. There's lots more talks to look forward to this morning. So uh, Patricio Becerra will talk more about the stratigraphy. So I'll try to avoid stepping on, on these topics too heavily. Um, Melinda Kyer will talk about the clim Amazonian climate modeling. So there's that term again, Amazonian, the last three billion years or so. And Christine, Christine Hitberg will talk about uh, terrestrial approaches and how we might um, maybe generalize some of those to Mars. OK, so the polar layer deposits then are two of very four lar large ice sheets in the inner solar system. And these are the two local ones, Antarctica and Greenland, which um, you've all seen pictures of, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the third and the fourth largest uh, ice sheets in the inner solar system are actually not on Earth, but on Mars. So check out the volumes here, 30 and 6 million uh, cubic kilometers of ice. You go down to the third and fourth ones, and you're down to about 1 million cubic kilometers of ice, or maybe 1.5 million cubic kilometers of ice. Um, so they're not as big as, as Greenland, um, but they're sort of approaching that, that scale. These are the two north poles of Mars. So we have North Pole on the left, South Pole on the right. This is topography data. And these are profiles across these deposits. So in this case here, it's uh, C to C prime here. And you can see from the scale here that there's several kilometers worth of ice. So uh, in thickness, they're very similar to Greenland. Um, in extent, they're a little bit, they're a little bit smaller. Um, the North Pole of Mars and the South Pole, uh, to a lesser extent, has also got all these spiral troughs that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But you can kind of see in the topography map as well. And they both have these large chasms that, uh, that kind of cut the, the polar layer deposits here, which we'll also talk about um, as, the, as, the, as the slides progress. Um, but this is the, the large overview here. The scale bar gives you an idea of how big they are. It's about 1,000 kilometers from end to end on these, uh, on these ice sheets. OK, so um, the troughs is, are where we see a lot of the layer exposures. Um, and they look somewhat like this. And it was a long time before we got radar data that allowed us to see layering in between the troughs. So a lot of our conclusions still stem from 
these, uh, these exposures that we see on, uh, on these trough walls. But if you take a, a topographic profile, say from the edge up to the pole here, as Kentanaka has done in this paper, you can see these troughs that are basically cut several hundred meters into uh, these deposits. And um, there are a few hundred meters in relief, but this is hideously vertically exaggerated, and actually the slopes are very low. They're only 5 to 10 degrees or so. They're also kind of asymmetric in that this, um, the, uh, the wall that faces the equator is higher and steeper than this wall that faces the floor, the pole. And when you zoom up uh, with a high-resolution imager, you can see lots of these layers here, which are where the, the polar layer deposits get their name. Uh, zooming up even further, like say for this example, you can see in these troughs that uh, they're mantled by this dust-colored uh, material that has little speckles of frost all over it still. Um, but it's not the bright icy material that you see on the, uh, on the polar cap flat areas, but rather uh, what we think is a sublimation lag, so these troughs sublimate, and uh, this dust that's in the ice gets concentrated on their surface. You can see uh, in some places this dust lag kind of sags, and you've got these little slumps and so on on it. So um, this, uh, this dust is probably uh, fairly thick and fairly insulating, protecting the ice underneath. At other parts of the polar layer deposits, uh, like where these outlines in red here, you've got steep cliffs that are, are quite different from the troughs. So these bounding cliffs have uh, slopes of 70 or 80 degrees. And uh, they undergo a lot of thermoelastic stresses because they're basically getting heated to such a large extent um, that, uh, that the expansion and contraction of the ice causes it to crack up in this polygonal appearance. So that's another way to access the layers or information about the layers, although it's in a very different uh, sort of uh, situation. Um, these cliffs are actively retreating as well. So here's the same spot imaged with high rise on, two, uh, on one of these cliffs. And uh, you can see before and after pictures here. If you look at this section here, and then you come back the next year, then a 70 meter wide slab of ice is just uh, being uh, has just come off there. And basically, uh, you can see some of the debris here, but it is broken up into such small pieces that they've all sublimated away pretty quickly. So there's lots of change going on on these steep cliffs. And actually, if you look in the spring, you can even see avalanches in progress on uh, on a lot of these cliffs. So you know, you can ask yourself if a uh, question if you flew over a mountain range on the Earth and took a picture, what are the odds of uh, capturing an avalanche in progress? And they're probably pretty small. Um, but uh, at this particular season uh, on these cliffs at Mars, half of the images that we take of these uh, cliffs have an avalanche in progress as we fly over it. So these things are, uh, are going off like very frequently. And I often think if uh, we ever get into space entrepreneurship, that I'll have a viewing platform right there. <laughs> And I'll charge admission, and you can sit there with a cocktail and watch these avalanches one after another <laughs> come roaring down this cliff face. Um, so these are probably also related to the, the, the block falls and the thermoelastic stresses that we, uh, that we see. Um, OK, so not only do we have these exposures in troughs and uh, cliffs at the PLD, but we also now, over the past decade, have uh, subsurface radar data. So the Sherrod instrument and the Marsis instrument, um, as well to a, to a different extent, has really illuminated the inside, uh, no pun intended, but really illuminated the inside of these deposits. Um, and this is a sample radar gram, which is basically, in this direction, it's either depth or time, delay time for the radar to come back. And this is the spatial direction here, with the, the location of that profile down below. And uh, one of the things that we could immediately conclude from these data are that these layers are continuous over the entire deposit. And that wasn't uh, a given um, before this observation was made. Uh, nobody really knew whether this was a patchwork of small layered sections that overlapped or whether this was really like one big contiguous um, record. And it turns out that it's the latter, that it's a big contiguous record, which bodes well for it being connected to climate <coughs> and for us getting useful information out of this. Um, there's been a lot of efforts to connect um, layer exposures, for example, this one, which is in this trough over here, to the radar reflections. But that's very difficult, right? Because high rise is looking at layers that are very thin. Uh, Sherrod is looking at these very wide uh, radar reflections. And what causes a radar reflection and what causes a layer to be visible to us in an exposure may not be uh, the same thing. Um, the thinnest layers that we can see with high rise are probably about 10 centimeters thick. And that's because they're um, outcropping on these very low slopes, so 10 centimeters get stretched out. 
quite a ways. Um, the thinnest layers that you can see uh, with Sherrod are probably a couple of meters thick. Uh, so there's a, there's a disconnect there. Um, with 10 centimeters per layer, if really all the layers were that size, then we'd expect like about 10,000 layers in this, um, in this polar deposit as a whole. Uh, so we've got you know, a book with 10,000 pages in it, um, but we still don't speak the language the book is written in. OK, so um, underneath all this is also uh, what we call this uh, basal unit. And we had seen this in images um, before Sherrod came along. And Sherrod really ma helped us map out the full extent of that and where it outcrops. Um, but this is essentially part of the polar deposits that also has some climatic information in it, but we're not really, again, sure what that is. So here's a small section of the polar layer deposits. So these are icy uh, layers. Down below here, we have this basal uh, unit lower in the section where it's interbedded sand and ice layers. And um, that sand is actually being eroded out of these cliffs and goes to form uh, a giant sea of sand dunes that are around the, the North Polar Cap. OK, in the South Pole, um, things are uh, much the same, but with a few small differences. Um, the layer exposures in the South appear quite different than the North. So this is an example of northern layers here. It's very smoothly varying at the scale of the images. South polar layers, on the other hand, look kind of jagged and gnarly and like they've been eroded to a much greater extent. Uh, they often also commonly have this stair-step appearance that you don't see very often in the, in the North Polar deposits. Sherrod has been active in the South Pole as well, of course. So uh, Sherrod radiograms crisscross this area. And um, for the most part, the South Pole radar signatures are very difficult to interpret. There's a kind of diffuse radar fog that obscures a lot of the layering. Uh, which is so crystal clear in the north, uh, it's just very difficult in the south. But this is one area here, part of the south polar layer deposits called Promethea lingula, that uh, has very clear uh, layering. Uh, but that's the exception rather than, rather than the rule. Um, of course, with high rise, we get, again, um, high res views of these layers, just another example here. And again, you see this sort of stair step uh, morphology rather, and the, the sort of more rugged appearance that. Uh, than you get in the in the north polar layers. Okay, so um, we also, of course, have other data sets uh, other than topography and uh, radar. Um, so there's visible and near infrared studies about the compositions of these materials. We've had the Phoenix lander go to a near polar location, although it didn't touch the polar deposits itself. And there's quite a lot of information to be gained from looking at these other data sets too. So uh, this is the north polar area. And you can see straight away that there's a bright ice cap here, uh, surrounded by um, terrain that's mostly dusty. And in these darker areas, it's mostly uh, sandy, um, basaltic sand in the case of, in, uh, case of Mars. So this, um, this large uh, ice cap is water ice at the surface. The whole, and it covers the polar layer deposits that you saw in the topography data, you know, pretty much exactly like this edge here is the edge of the polar layer deposits. And it's mostly the edge of the bright icy stuff. There's a couple of outlying materials here and some craters with uh, material inside that's probably quite like the polar layer deposits and a few kilometers thick in its own right. Um, the surrounding plains here is called Vastitis Borealis, or the northern wasteland. And it's actually a very apt description. I mean, this is like the Kansas of Mars, where if you were to go there, <laughs> uh, sorry for people from Kansas. Uh, Kansas always gets, gets trashed in these talks. Um, but if you were to go there, uh, which we did right at that point here, you would see something like this. And it's essentially like a really flat area of ground. There's ice in the surface here below, uh, a few centimeters down. Um, but if you were to like, just get dropped there and look around, that's what you would see. Um, so not a lot going on in this area around here. But then uh, you've got this giant dome of polar ice that just grows or out, of this, uh, out of this plain. Um, this residual ice cap, the bright icy stuff, uh, is very interesting. And uh, oftentimes, it's sort of referred to as the, the ongoing layer that's forming today. And that this is a surface ice deposit that's interacting with the current climate, uh, much like all the layers in the polar layer deposits used to be. I mean, they used to be surface deposits interacting with the current climate. Um, so this residual ice cap uh, has a lot of interesting textures on it. So in some places, it looks sort of like uh, a little bit of a maze. So you probably don't want to get dropped on the surface and get lost in amongst all this stuff. Um, in other places, it's got this sort of homogeneous 
texture where it's just icy patch, defrosted patch, icy patch, defrosted patch. And these patches are about 10 meters across here. A blow up here shows that they're textured down at the sort of one meter level into sun cup type uh, morphologies. Uh, the really interesting thing about this deposit, though, is uh, comes from the spectral information. So um, I forgot to put the reference here. This is a paper by uh, Yves Langevin in 2005. And uh, the different colors here correspond to near-infrared spectra of the water ice at different times of the year. So as the seasonal cap retreats, seasonal frost, uh, both CO2 and water gets concentrated uh, on the remaining cold part of the cap, like right over the pole. And when the CO2 disappears, all of this area is covered with fine-grained water frost, which is very bright and doesn't have very deep absorption features. But as the summer wears on, um, that seasonal water frost all disappears, and uh, the true residual ice is left. And you see very large-grained ice abruptly appear as the seasonal frost disappears. And uh, that large-grained ice is also uh, dust-free. So it's like big, old crystals of ice, old being because it's large-grained. And, um, and it appears then that this deposit in a, is in a state of net ablation. I'll talk a little bit more about what the uh, what the the current activity or the current mass balance of this cap probably is uh, as we get toward the end of the talk, um, but there's very little uh, very little other compositional information available for this bright icy deposit on the surface. Um, so just backing up a little bit, this dark area that surrounds the polar cap here is made of s of sand dunes, and um, they look pretty much exactly like terrestrial sand dunes. It's black or bluish in our high-rise stretched color images, uh, basaltic flakes uh, that are in the sand size regime. So uh, they saltate around and form dunes. Uh, the dunes are probably ice cemented. The thermal uh, uh, work has, uh, has demonstrated that's probably the case. And uh, as I said, they're all coming from this deposit underlying the polar, underlying the polar cap. So at some point in Mars's history, maybe millions or maybe tens of millions of years ago, this uh, layered ice and sand cake was sort of deposited, and uh, the polar layer deposits covered it, but then the polar layer deposits are retreating back and exposing some of the sand that's now uh, surrounding the, uh, the, the water ice dome in the, around the North Pole. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of geologic history and, and, uh, and a story to tease apart here. Um, the sand itself has kind of got an interesting compositional uh, traits that, uh, again, have only really been uncovered in the last 10 years or so. So gypsum turns out to be a very common uh, mineral in this sand, which is not uh, common in sand on the rest of uh, Mars. Also, uh, perchlorite, uh, which is a salt that was first discovered by the Phoenix lander on Mars, I believe. Uh, but now it's thought to be more, much more widespread. And uh, perchloride has a very interesting property of lowering the melting point of, uh, of ice or, or water, rather. To, uh, to extremely low uh, values, so the eutectic is between 200 and 210 uh, Kelvin for, uh, for perchlorite water solution. Um, so uh, how these uh, minerals got incorporated into this cap and, and what that means for the history of, uh, of the polar layer deposits is still being teased apart. OK, so uh, the South Pole uh, looks quite different. And if you were to zoom up on that and take a look in the visible data set, you wouldn't see a lot. So if you remember the topography map, the South Polar Layer Deposits actually extends all the way down here, out like that. It's, it's quite large, but you really can't see it from this view, right? I mean, this is just an optical picture. Um, so uh, you don't really see the topography signature of the South Polar Layer Deposits. And in terms of color or thermal properties or albedo, there's really not much contrast between the South Polar Layer Deposits and the surrounding material. They're covered with the same sort of dusty, insulating lag that uh, everything else around here is covered in. Um, there's one small area up here that is actually very different from all the other polar deposits, and that's uh, a carbon dioxide ice uh, cap. And I'll show a couple of examples of what's going on there in a moment. Uh, but this is about five or 600 kilometers across here from end to end, and probably pretty thin, just a few meters uh, thick. But it's super high albedo and, um, and probably actively uh, accumulating uh, CO2 today. Um, so the surface of the South Polar Layer Deposit, though, does look a little bit different from the surroundings. And uh, that difference is uh, mostly because of these features uh, that have been dubbed spiders. So they look spider-like in that they've got a body and lots of legs coming out of them. But these are 
pits with lots of troughs feeding into them. And this is something that, uh, that really came, uh, that was really discovered in the early 2000s with the first high res imaging. And uh, Hugh Kiefer, um, who's not here today, uh, really pioneered the model uh, that was based on uh, something that happens on Triton, which uh, is that the seasonal CO2 cap that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, can become transparent in places. It gets heated from below, and then the sublimating gas can kind of erupt in these geyser-like uh, formations. Um, the, the, the gas can tunnel grooves underneath the ice sheet and dredge up dust and so on, which is what these little spider legs are doing here, and dust and gas is venting out of the central areas of the vent. In this particular image, it's summertime and all the ice is gone, so all that you're left seeing are, are the eroded effects of, of, this, of this process. Um, so those spider-like features uh, cover most of the South Polar layer deposits, and that's you know, an issue as we think about uh, potential new missions and potentially uh, landing there. The last uh, effort to land on the South Polar layer deposits was Mars Polar Lander, and of course, uh, that was before most of the Mars Global Surveyor data came back. And Nobody knew about any of this. Um, in the carbon dioxide residual cap, uh, that big bright icy deposit, then um, we can see the landscape changing right before our eyes. So we've got these quasi-circular pits that grow uh, from year to year. There's also these linear forms of CO2 ice. So this is a very exotic place by terrestrial standards, and uh, one that's so thermally demanding that it's unlikely we'll have a mission to anytime soon. But it's, it's really neat, so I can't resist uh, showing some of the pictures. <laughs> Uh, so how about the bulk composition of these polar layer deposits then? Um, so there's, there's really two ways to get at this. One is the radar data, and the other is uh, gravity data. And before uh, these data sets were really uh, analyzed, I think it's fair to say that everybody believed it was polar layer deposits were dust and ice in some ratio, but whether they were like 1% dust or 50% dust, uh, that was kind of just you know, up in the air. Um, but with radar data sets, we can look to see how transparent these deposits are at radar wavelengths, and they turn out to be extraordinarily transparent. So probably the polar layer deposits are greater than 95% ice. Um, the internal reflections that mark out the layers obviously tell us that that varies as a function of depth, and, uh, and that's really you know, something that we would want to know a lot more about to tease out what the climatic record is. Uh, the gravity analysis, uh, which has only been possible for the south polar layer deposits, indicates uh, a slightly denser material than we would expect. So the south polar layer deposits are probably about 15% by dust. Um, but there's also significant geographic variability in that number. So uh, it's kind of unfortunate that we can do the gravity analysis in the south, but not the north. And the radar um, transparency measurements can be done in the north, but not in the south. Uh, so we can't directly compare this, but, uh, but it's likely that the south polar layer deposits have more dust in them than, than the north. Also in the South Polar layer deposits are large buried CO2 deposits. And this was a surprise when it was discovered. And um, so here's a radar gram of the South Pole, a uh, part of the South Polar layer deposits. And there you see there are these areas that are free of returned radar power. And the cartoon here basically shows what's happening. There are uh, mostly CO2 deposits and then with a small amount of water ice uh, with in these uh, layers that are cutting through it. OK, so um, that's what's there. And I'll talk a little bit about how it got there and how it's changed over the years. So uh, when these polar layer deposits were discovered, it was in or about the same time realized that Mars was undergoes very big changes in its uh, obliquity and orbital eccentricity and so on. And um, those changes have been refined over the years, where we are now at a point where we can pretty confidently uh, predict what Mars's orbital parameters have been for the last 10 to 20 million years. The two major changes are the obliquity of a planet. So this is how far a planet is tilted over relative to its orbital plane. So a high obliquity planet would have its pole pointed tw more toward the sun during summer than a low obliquity planet down here would. And of course, orbital eccentricity is just a measure of how circular uh, the orbit is. There's another um, orbital variation that I don't talk about. And oh, I stepped on the defense spot. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> There's another. Orbital variation that I didn't talk about here, for these eccentric orbits, this entire orbit also rotates around. And that also drives climate change on Mars over even faster cycles. Uh, but that's more minor than, uh, than obliquity, which is, uh, which is the biggest thing here. So um, if we were to look at these uh, orbital variations, then 
um, over the past million years, which is present day on the left, one million years ago on the right here, obliquity has these very large versions here, uh, excursions here. Uh, this green line represents what Earth's obliquity has been doing in the same time period. So, you know, little wiggles, but nothing, nothing really uh, too impressive. Uh, overall eccentricity is also varied quite a lot, and if you put those together, you can figure out how solar power at the pole has changed. And there are big variations here. So there's a factor of two between two and 400 here where polar climate could be changing quite a lot. And so this is what we think is recorded in these layers, but it's filtered through many things. It's filtered through uh, what is the impact of these orbital variations on the uh, climate, what is the impact of the climate on the deposition rates of ice and dust, and then how do different ice and dust demands actually affect you know, the visible appearance of these layers. So there's quite a few hurdles to jump through before we can connect uh, this and, and this. Um, the big picture for climate variation on Mars is that at high obliquities, you get high amounts of insulation at the poles. So at high obliquity, we expect ice to be ablated from the poles and recondense in the mid-latitudes. So this is a famous cartoon figure from uh, Jim Head and his colleagues in the early 2000s. At low obliquity, we expect ice in the mid-latitudes to become unstable and to recondense at the poles. So as obliquity varies back and forth, we expect um, the uh, ice to move sort of equatorward and poleward. At very, very high obliquity, ice can even move to the equator itself and form big glaciers in the, on the Tharsis volcanoes and so on. Um, over long time periods, so I mentioned we had these orbital solutions going back many millions of years, we see even bigger variations in uh, insulation. So this is the same plots before, but going back 10 million years instead of one. And you can see the uh, variations in insulation here. Uh, and then five, four to five million years ago, that climbs abruptly to a much higher uh, obliquity value. And then actually, although we can't specifically say what the obliquity was early in Mars's history, Mars has spent most of its life uh, in a very high obliquity state. So polar deposits might be the exception rather than the rule here. Um, so there's a factor of three now going back over the lifetime of these deposits variation in, uh, in what the solar power might be. And a factor of three on the Earth in terms of insulation leads to very different outcomes, as you can see here, from tropical rainforests to the north coast of Antarctica. Um, at, so that big jump in obliquity four million years ago or so uh, can be turned into polar accumulation rates through some modeling. And a couple of people have tried this, but I'll show one here. This is a study by Levrard and his colleagues uh, in 2007. And again, we've got time moving forward in this direction here. So this is years ago. So four million years ago, the black line here shows thickness of the polar deposits. And although there's some ups and downs on this, it basically starts climbing four million years ago to the present thickness. Uh, it's thought that more than four million years ago, that there's just no way to preserve uh, polar ice deposits. Now, uh, that's, of course, uh, in model land. And uh, in reality, it's probably a bit more complicated. Sublimation lags can form that cut off interaction with the atmosphere. And uh, this, this simple uh, <coughs> picture doesn't agree with the very large age of the south polar layer deposits, which cratering studies suggest is, is in the tens of millions of years of range. OK, but it's a, it's a good start, and this 4 million year uh, number has become firmly entrenched in our thinking. OK, um, so a few more historical um, uh, events just before I wrap up. As these polar deposits grow, grew from 4 million years onward, um, a lot of thing, information can be pulled out of the radar data sets. Uh, so we can map out single reflectors and their paleo surfaces, so we can see what the top of the basal unit looked like. So this is before the polar layer deposits start growing. Uh, so the basal unit is mostly concentrated over here. And uh, the polar layer deposits start growing up uh, after that. Uh, there's another unconformity within the polar layer deposits we can map out the surface of. And then we can see uh, the polar layer deposits growing here and here, kind of independently of each other, with two large chasmas. Uh, this large chasma ends up going away because uh, it gets filled in by higher accumulation rates. And this one just uh, persists. So this is the thickness of the, uh, of the ice and the polar layer deposits at the moment uh, when you subtract out this basal topography. And it ends up being close to 2,000 meters at its thickest point, um, slightly off the top of this scale, uh, right around that location. Um, you can do that in more detail. So like, uh, like Putzig and all have done, you can delineate several uh, of these contacts here. 
the radar data can be divided up into areas that have packets of layers and areas that don't, and then you can put together what the, the NPLD has looked like through time as it grows uh, up to its current, um, current state. So there's a lot of information, historical information available now that we, uh, that we didn't have before. Um, the troughs, another interesting um, in feature of the NPLD, can also be traced back to uh, their origin by these discontinuities in the stratigraphy that they cause. So these troughs are migrating poleward. As remember, the sublimation lag on these walls indicates that ice is being removed. And uh, when they migrate poleward, uh, the, the polar cap is accumulating at the same time. So this, this trace here tells you what the path of that trough was. And uh, these traces only start partway through the polar record. So at some point, the pol polar layer deposits develop this system of troughs midway through its history. They're not, uh, they're not primordial features. OK, so uh, I'm running a little short on time, so I'll just um, skip one or two slides um, to get to something uh, else that I want to talk about. Uh, the most recent accumulation here, um, so this is right up at the top of the sequence now. Isaac has done some work on this, showing that the top 100 meters is probably accumulated in the last 400,000 years or so. Um, this is very important, of course, because all of these troughs are sampling only the top few hundred meters, and any uh, investigation that we might send that would drill into the surface would probably only sample the first few hundred meters. So understanding this part of the stratigraphy is, is of prime importance. OK, so um, one comment before wrapping up then is uh, what the, uh, the accumulation rate is today. So I think it's clear that the SPLD uh, isn't accumulating at all because it's covered with this dusty material that's probably a sublimation lag. And uh, there's no fresh water ice at the surface at all. But in the North Polar Air Deposit, which has this water ice cap, uh, it's a less clear cut. So orbital elements here are about mid-range for obliquity. It would have been crystal clear if uh, Mars had cooperated and we had been observing it at a time when the obliquity was very high or very low. We would have known what was going on straight away. But in this mid-range, unfortunately, uh, it, it's less clear. Um, the bright, dust-free appearance and the crater population indicate that the ice is young and probably accumulating up to a little recently. But then this large-grained ice, as I mentioned, indicates that old ice is being exposed every year and being lost. So uh, it's possible that MPLD accumulation may have just recently ended. And we're in this phase where everything is very finely balanced. And it's not quite clear in which direction the mass uh, transport is going. OK, so for the rest of the study then, um, you know, I kind of in my own mind tried to break this up into several uh, areas. And uh, we have the orbital elements change that's driving climate change. We can also investigate this from the polar record to get at these ancient climate changes. Um, and some of this is more advanced than others. So the orbital elements, I would say, for the time sales we care about, thanks to Jacques Lascar, is uh, a solved problem. Um, converting those into climate changes is uh, an area where a lot of progress has been made. And you'll see that in Melinda's talk uh, later. Um, but still, there's lots of work to do here. Reading the polar record is something that we've all also made a lot of progress on, especially on trying to figure out what packets of layers correspond to what ages. But uh, there's lots more to do then. This part, though, of converting these layers into information about climate is an area where there's been a stubborn lack of progress. and. Um, that is where we put our KISS workshop right here. So can we figure out something about these past climates from the layers? And, uh, and what is that? So you could ask the inverse problem of if we came back in a million years and we looked at a layer that's forming today, I mean, what would it look like? What does today's climate look like in the stratigraphic record in the future? And uh, if we can't answer that forward question, then it's very hard to do the inverse problem and take these layers and go back to previous climates. OK, so final slide then, just to sum up. We have these very large polar layer deposits, much like the Greenland ice sheet on the Earth, that get exposed every year uh, when the seasonal <coughs> CO2 and H2O frost goes away. There's probably about 10,000 layers there, so there's a lot of information. There's probably unc or there are unconformities, so this information is not complete. And uh, the exposures that we're looking at are actually part of the historical story. So these troughs and scarfs have moved around and are actively retreating um, uh, today. So they all, that story has to be factored into how we read the record that they're exposing. So we've had substantial progress. But I think there's this one stubborn area that we haven't had a lot of progress in, which is converting the layers to climatic information. And that's why we're all here this week. And so I want to welcome everybody again to the workshop and look forward to the next few talks that will go into more detail. <laughs>